How do we extend collective bargaining at the workplace, which has been around since the 1860s, to collective bargaining around consumer purchasing? Like, How do we bring communities and labor unions together to say, we're all buying cable TV, we're all buying cell phones, many of us are buying diapers, why don't we all come together and negotiate with the internet providers, be they Amazon or big box stores and everyone else, to get those prices down? and exercise that power as workers and communities together. And let's take a portion of that savings and use it for community organizing or to fund politics so that politicians don't have to go to wealthy donors in order, just in order to get reelected, but they can be more accountable to the people. It isn't just pie in the sky. You have experience of some of this, uh, particularly around the kind of group purchasing. Yeah. Describe some of your, I don't want to call them experiments exactly, but experiences. Well, this is something that, um, is not new either. Um, uh, Jewish housewives in the Lower East Side in 100 years ago started consumer organizing against uh, kosher butchers who were overcharging for meat. Um, and there are lots and lots of examples of this in the US and all around the world. Um, uh, a bunch of folks in Boulder, Colorado 15 years ago, 5,000 of them came together and bought cell phones. And they got uh, $600,000 a year from a cell phone company for that collective contract. And um, 13 years ago, NYCHA residents tested the market. What if we bought cable together, public housing residents? They got offers of over 30 million a year from cable companies if they would just do that one thing. Mm. And so this is something that has been tried in many other places. I think with big data, with online purchasing, where the vendor companies, be they banks or MasterCard or Visa, they already have the data. Yeah. They can tell any of us who buys what, block by block, where they buy it, when they buy it. That data can be a powerful organizing tool when it's in the hands of the people. So one of the things we're doing now is doing popular education. People need to own their data. 97% of Facebook's profits last year were selling people's data without their permission or knowledge. People need to own that data. It can be powerful. The digital economy can be used as a social, an organizing tool, a liberating tool. It doesn't have to be just for corporations to extract. But we have to organize and educate ourselves to take it. And we have to do it fast. Well, that's right. New York City published a 2050 plan, uh, one NYC, with 13 volumes of specific policy proposals and ideas about what should the future of transportation be in New York. What, how should New York deal with climate change? How should New York deal with affordable housing? How should New York deal with change in the economy? All that's written. Yeah. It was submitted to the UN, and it doesn't mean that these are the only ideas that make sense, but it means here's a vision for what urban America, for what cities around the world really ought to engage with. Two last questions. The Green New Deal, some people are afraid that the right will seize on it and sell people on the idea that it is a stick to beat the poor with and small businesses, um, forcing landlords to pay enormous ma amounts to green their buildings, for example, costs that will be passed on to, to their occupants, or businesses, the same thing. How do you address that? How do you do greening in a way that doesn't displace? And then the last question I have to ask you is about the budget for prisons and incarceration. Uh, the mayor's plan has $11 billion to keep Rikers Island, um, a former penal colony, alive and working f till 2026. Is, what's your alternative for that? Well, on the issue of a uh, Green New Deal or greening cities, uh, climate change is happening. It's inevitable. Uh, New York City has over 500 miles of coastline, um, seawater coastline. Um, the oceans are expected to rise at least six feet uh, in this century. And so this is something we have to deal with. It's not a choice. We have to deal with it. Uh, we, are, uh, we have to reduce carbon. Uh, we see the changes in climate. Um, we see the changes in weather. Um, buildings are about 40% of our carbon load. Uh, Indian Point Power Plant is closing in a few years. That's 20% of our energy. We have to retrofit buildings. I think a lot of the reaction against this is because people don't, there's, it's not a system yet. How do you easily retrofit your building. It's not the money. The, it will pay for itself in reduced energy costs over time. But 
Banks aren't used to it. Financial institutions aren't used to it. The companies that actually can do it, they're not here, or they're not many of them. Where's the workforce for this? How is this going to work? Germany created an agency to actually work on these problems, and they've been around for decades, and it's worked. So we have to do that in order to make this something easy and simple, uh, logical for building owners, but the necessity is unquestioned. Um, and I think it can create jobs for a generation. When we talk about these problems, America's infrastructure is crumbling. I read the National Association of Civil Engineers reports every year. It's not popular reading, but they're far more radical than a AOC or anyone else who's talking yeah. about green because they just detail all of our infrastructure problems that are happening, and they're calling for five trillion of, um, of immediate investments to maintain our infrastructure. Great opportunities for making New York more beautiful, for eliminating poverty in the course of dealing with these issues, for really engaging the citizenry together in a common effort and enterprise. It can be great for our democracy. So there are many upsides. As far as prison, I don't work specifically sure. on this. Uh, my main goal with the uh, uh, mass incarceration is actually let's create job opportunities for people who are at risk of going into prison, at risk of, or when they come out of prison. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, one in four or so on our construction projects will be from vulnerable neighborhoods. The construction trades have created a program for people coming out of prison so that they can go in and, and become carpenters and other trades, and we need to do a whole lot more of that kind of thing. In terms of Rikers shutting down and building new prisons, uh, most communities are accepting uh, the construction of new prisons, but to me, that is uh, the beginning. What we really need to focus on is how do we minimize th the number of people who are in prison in the first place. When people are in prison, how do they learn how to reshape their lives? How do they get an education? How do they get mental health services if they need it? What's our vision for that? How can communities interact more with prisons? There's a prison in Alameda County, uh, California, where it's totally off the grid. Uh, and the prisoners are trained on how to do green infrastructure work while in prison. And when they come out, they have marketable skills. How do we begin to mm. do that in our prisons? You mentioned Alameda. My last question, who do you call when you want an ear to talk to? Who are your allies globally or, or nationally who are doing this kind of work at the level that you are? Because you're, I don't want to say you're pretty unique. I would say you are unique. Um, but I'm sure you have allies and colleagues. So for many years, I've worked with uh, people in the Basque region of Spain. Um, I have uh, many friends in Britain. I have worked for many years with the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. Uh, I've worked in South America quite a bit. Um, we had 30 businesses come from Colombia two weeks ago uh, to partner with MWBEs here in New York City. Um, and it's around the same framework. How do you avoid civil war reemerging in Colombia? Well, let's have economic democracy in Colombia. Um, I uh, work with uh, Triodos in the Netherlands and uh, Global Alliance for Banking on Values. It's in many continents now, and it's a movement amongst banks. How do we actually finance economic democracy? How do we make it transparent for banks so that people can see when you put a deposit in my bank, Here's the company we put in, uh, we invest in. Here's what they pay their workers. Here's how they treat the environment. Own, own your, be responsible. Every dollar is like a vote. So how do you actually vote for what you believe in? So there are many, many, I'm learning more every day, cities around the world. Montreal has reached out. Uh, the new government in Mexico City, the chief of staff for the new president is Lázaro Cárdenas, who himself was governor of Michoacán was very much a believer in these kinds of approaches. Right. So I think there's a movement around the world that's underway. The U.S. is a little behind.